Dr. William Rees is world famous as the originator of ecological footprint analysis, a remarkable instrument designed to actually measure the demands that each of us and each of our societies is placing on the productive capacity of our planet. The Earth, after all, can only provide so much food and water and can only absorb a finite amount of waste. If you divide the productive capacity of the Earth by the number of people on the planet, you can estimate the share of the planet's capacity that each human being is entitled to. By extension, footprint analysis can also show how much of the Earth's carrying capacity is actually being taken up by any particular human population. It shows that the consumer societies of the West are taking up far more than their share of the Earth's resources, while the Third World is taking up far less. And it also shows that the idea of endless economic growth is a destructive pipe dream. The Earth has limits, so the economy must have limits too. Bill Rees's book, Our Ecological Footprint, written with his colleague, Matthias Wackernagel, has been published in numerous languages around the world. Since 1969, he has been a professor at the University of British Columbia. I spoke with him at his home in Vancouver. A lot of what you've been doing comes under the general heading of human ecology. And it's my understanding that when you started out as a student, there was no such thing. Well, there, there were versions of human ecology, but they were mostly in geography and sociology. What there wasn't was a well-developed branch of science in which human beings were considered as a species within ecosystems. So traditionally, academic ecologists study pristine nature, non-human species, and left humans out. So when I actually asked if I could study humans as a graduate student, I was told that yes, I could, but it would be in anthropology, sociology, or perhaps economics, certainly not in ecology. And that's completely changed. I wouldn't say so. It's no. not completely changed. There's now a branch of uh, scientific ecology or academic ecology called systems ecology, which certainly does take human beings as part of the ecosystem and at the center of things. But most academic ecology is still almost entirely focused on non-human nature. Just by the way, as economics, which is human ecology, is focused exclusively on humans with almost no reference to nature. So we have a real paradox here in, in that the two disciplines which purport to be ecology uh, really in, in many respects have taken a long time to gather their legs under them in dealing with the question of sustainability, for example, mm -hmm. because academic ecology focused on nature but not humans, economics focused exclusively on humans but had nothing to say about the relationship of humans between humans and nature. And frankly, we're pretty much stuck in that position still in the mainstream, even though some of us have moved way beyond it in our own work. Mm -hmm. And you were concerned very early on about carrying capacity. Mm -hmm. right? Tell me about that and about how that leads to the uh, ecological footprint. Well, <clears throat> I, as I say, I was interested in human ecology. Um, I couldn't find a job in a university, in, a college in, a, in an ecology department that would let me study humans. So I stretched out and uh, to my absolute delight was able to win a position at UBC, a joint position between what was then the Institute of Animal Resource Ecology headed by Buzz Holling, one of Canada's greats, and uh, the School of Community and Regional Planning. So I had a joint position. I could keep my one foot in the academic domain, as it were, and where my roots were, but I was free to teach what I wanted about human ecology in a planning school. So I was struggling to find concepts, because this was such a novel idea, that could translate from animal ecology into human ecology. Uh, keep in mind, this is in the early 1970s. Limits to growth had not yet been published. And carrying capacity seemed to be one principle that made sense. Uh, carrying capacity by ecologists is just defined as the maximum average population of a given species that can occupy a habitat without destroying that habitat. So we think of range capacity if we're talking about cattle or moose in a, a field. You can only have so many before they wreck their own habitat. Well, are humans any different? So I did a quick and dirty little model of the lower mainland of BC just to assess what its carrying capacity should be. How much human body mass, biomass, could it support at a defined standard of living? 
And I came up with an answer, I think it was somewhere between 35,000 and 50,000 max. Well, I gave this little paper at a gathering of colleagues, and uh, one of whom happened to be one of UBC's and, and Canada's prime resource economists, who took me aside after the presentation and said that uh, he really had to take me to lunch to talk about my, my ideas around carrying capacity. And I was delighted to get this recognition from a very prominent economist. So we met, and indeed he gave me a very fine lunch, but he said, look, I've really come to tell you that if you continue to pursue this line of work, this area of research, then your academic career at UBC is going to be nasty, bitter, and short. Which was a very Habibs Habibsian way <laughs> yes. of, of looking at things, of course. But those were his exact words. And he then proceeded to uh, tell me how economists had long since abolished the concept of carrying capacity. That because of technological development, uh, the, the human ingenuity would always keep us ahead of, of the Malthusian idea that we could never produce enough food to sustain ourselves. And in any case, why should this region be constrained by its own resource base when it can re import things from all over the planet? Now, I'd never heard of, of the idea that uh, economists took to be doctrine that technology could continually substitute for um, nature. I was familiar with trade, obviously, and, and he pointed out that how can you say the carrying capacity of this area is only 50,000 if there's already a million people living here? And, you know, that, that's a reasonable question. So I went away from that meeting feeling uh, somewhat, well, I had my tail between my legs, to be honest, because I was exploring new ideas. I'd never had a course in economics. He gave me a stack of things to read. And the more I read, the more I became uncomfortable with the economist's position, but I had no real response to it at that point. To make a long story short, I woke up one night, actually two or three years later, with one of those light bulbs over my head. It was my Yahoo movement moment. And I realized that, look, it's true. If we define carrying capacity as the number of humans that could live in this region, then it means nothing if you can import all you need from everywhere else, or if technology is going to do this, that, or whatever, improve efficiency mainly. But if we turn that carrying capacity ratio over and ask how much area is required to support this number of people, wherever on earth that area may be, you have, you're in an entirely different ballgame. So what the economists hadn't really taken into account was that the fact that, the fact that trade in goods to sustain a population is really importing land from someplace else. So a country like the Netherlands, for example, uh, we've now uh, shown occupies about seven times as much land outside of itself as is available within its domestic territory. And that's all acquired through trade. And it means that in, in some sense, the, the carrying capacity of the Netherlands has been artificially inflated by its appropriation of, of, of biocapacity from other parts of the planet. And although places like the Netherlands or Japan, which is in a very similar state, are often held up as models for the world to follow because high populations, not much in the way of resources, but extremely rich, they're not models because for every place like them that's running a huge ecological deficit, there has to be another place that has a, a comparable um, surplus. And the fact of the matter is that about 80% of the people on the planet right now live in countries running ecological deficits. And a relatively few countries have surpluses. Canada happens to be one of them. Um, of course, the global commons has a lot of uh, capacity as well. But the main point of it is that the carrying capacity of most high-income, densely populated countries uh, the populations of those countries now vastly exceed their domestic carrying capacities and they're living by drawing down the biocapacity and surpluses in other countries, which has two effects. First, it inhibits the, the growth of these other places to some extent. And it means that uh, the countries that are dependent on imports uh, can continue to expand oblivious of the fact that they're causing ecological damage half a planet away. So we now have a planetary circumstance in which we're all dedicated to perpetual growth, but we've removed the negative feedback from the environment that shows we're in excess of carrying capacity. Um, the net effect is that we're all going to hit it at the same time. In fact, we already have when it comes to climate change and fisheries collapses and so on.
but there's such momentum in the system, it's going to be very difficult to get people to back off. Mm -hmm. So if you're <coughs> explaining the, the, the concept of an ecological footprint to someone for the first time, how do you do that? What do you say to them? How do you describe it? Well, the ecological footprint is a very simple measure. It's intended to measure one thing. And that is, how big would the little planet required to support just Silver Donald Cameron B. Mm -hmm. So if you think for a moment, obviously you eat food, you eat water, you drink water, you deposit waste back into the environment. And if you multiply that by the thousands of products that we consume each of us every year, it's quite clear, and, and we can show this now, that every, everything we consume has an origin somewhere in the earth. And every waste that we produce has to be assimilated somewhere on the planet. And for this to happen sustainably, there has to be a continuous capacity to produce the things we consume and to assimilate those things that, that we waste. So the question for you is, how much land would be needed to grow food? How much to produce the wood fiber that you consume? How much is carbon assimilation land for the carbon that, or dioxide that you emit and so on and so forth? And if you added all that up, that's your personal planetoid. And that becomes, in effect, the footprint you have on the Earth. So every one of us, whether we're conscious of it or not, requires a certain land area, a productive ecosystem area, that is producing everything we consume and assimilating the wastes that we produce on a continuous basis. It's an exclusive area in that the land growing your food can't grow my food. I mean, obviously, Saskatchewan grows food for a lot of people, but you could apportion it, you know, square meter by square meter. So the point is then that the ecological footprint is de uh, designed simply as a measure of the productive ecosystem area required to sustain any specified population at any specified material standard. It's the area that the population uses on a continuous basis all over the planet to produce the resources it consumes and to assimilate uh, some of the important wastes. Mm -hmm. And. Um and basically, basically, you've been able to use that as a tool to describe global inequities, right? Oh, absolutely, and because uh, clearly, if, if you have a lot of money, you can uh, access the world's markets. And the world's markets are the way in which we expand our ecological footprints. So there's a very tight correlation between income and the demands that each of us makes on the planet. An average North American uses about nine hectares of global average productivity in order to sustain his lifestyle or her lifestyle. But if we go to the poorest countries in Africa, it's less than half a hectare. So there's at least a 20-fold difference in the scale of the impacts that rich people have compared to those of the very poorest people. And that's what we demand in this effect of the planet, to sustain us in the way that, in the style to which we become accustomed. That's right. And um, the, the simple fact is, if you take most rich countries' per capita footprints and, and uh, multiply that by their populations, then the demand by those countries exceeds their domestic territory. And we can show that the deficit is made up through trade. And right now, I mean, we're seeing in the world a situation in which countries are, are beginning not even to trust the normal market to acquire what they need from offshore. They're now uh, going into other countries and purchasing huge blocks of land to sustain themselves. So China, for example, has a couple of million hectares of Zaire, another couple million in the Congo. Saudi Arabia is buying large chunks of impoverished North African countries to grow grain for the home market. So in effect, those countries are establishing extraterritorial eco-footprints uh, now through long-term leasing or purchasing agreements, no longer satisfied that they can merely buy food in, in the global marketplace. And I think this, over the long run, will uh, turn out to be a very destabilizing trend in, in world geopolitics. Well, it's almost a new form of colonialism, isn't it? We just go and buy the country instead of conquering it. Yeah, right? absolutely. In fact, the whole idea of globalization is really the means by which wealthy countries can continue to appropriate the wealth of poorer countries uh, through legal means. So literally, we now achieve through uh, commerce what used to require um, territorial occupation. Mm -hmm. And the outright purchase or, or long-term leasing of landscape is uh, certainly part of that. In the sense of, uh, the, the instinctive sense of people all over the world that this globalization project is not of value to them as, uh, mm -hmm. as individual people um, turns out to be pretty well founded. 
Well, uh, certainly a lot of uh, ordinary folks have been disadvantaged by globalization. And there's no question that the net effect has been a, a huge increase in wealth creation on the planet. But we also know that most of the new wealth goes to the already wealthy. So it's, it's frequently the case, and uh, we can certainly see this through structural adjustment programs fostered by the World Bank and so on, that as the country's GDP per capita rises, its poorer classes may be impoverished, they're displaced from the land, they get fewer services from their governments, but the elites in those countries benefit. And so they may well support the continued uh, global growth model that sees that increasing inequity. The simple fact of the matter is that even though growth is supposed to solve our problem of poverty globally, that in the last 25 or 30 years of growth, we've seen an increasing poverty gap. And today, as we speak, the richest 20% of the world's people consume about 70 or take home about 75, 76% of income probably consume about 80% to 85% of private consumption. The poorest 20% of people get by on about a 1.5% of global income. And that uh, disparity is actually increasing. And that's, that's, and that's what this is supposed to be the solution, right? The rising tide is supposed to lift all boats and... Well, it lifts the bigger boats first and leaves some of the smaller ones uh, savaged by the reefs, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Let me come back to the footprint because you've also found ways to use that in, in, in much more uh, micro kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. I mean, for example, to describe the relationship between the United Kingdom's use of timber mm -hmm. and its growth of timber. So it turns out to be a very flexible instrument. Oh, yes. <clears throat> we can. Uh, it, the basic data that go into eco footprint analysis include all of the consumption and trade flows. So local, per well, let's put it this way. The ecological footprint is a land measure, a surrogate measure of consumption by a specified population. Consumption equals uh, domestic production plus imports minus exports. Now to make those kinds of calculus at, at the national level, we need data on virtually all of the, the components of trade. So um, we've done a number of studies in which we look at specific countries and specific trade goods to show how much of other countries is imported through uh, timber or food or whatever it might be. So that yes, I, we can tell you how much uh, tropical forest land Japan appropriates from the rest of the world. What uh, the Great, Great Britain's agricultural impact on the rest of the world is. These are all two way flows of course, but uh, we're looking at the net numbers and in those terms, most high-income countries in Europe, including, by the way, the United States and Australia, not in Europe, but elsewhere, have fairly significant ecological deficits. Let me back off. I said the United States and Australia. I meant uh, the United States and Japan are other examples of countries with large ecological deficits. Uh, Canada is one of the few with a surplus. But our surplus is taken up by other people's deficits. So we've just completed a study to show, for example, that about half of the um, land in the Canadian prairies, which produces about 80% of our agricultural trade, is exported. And we can nail that down to which countries appropriate what kinds of, of land base. So it becomes a very detailed tool in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you, yeah, you had a comment somewhere, I think, that said, to, in effect, that where there's a, that a surplus in one place um, can be created, in effect, only by creating a, a, a shortage in another place. Well, <clears throat> okay, no, not sure or the other way around. I'm, I'm not sure, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. So but there's a reciprocal relationship. If, mm -hmm. I'm, if I'm importing it, it's coming somebody away Somebody else somewhere. has to be producing it. Yeah, yeah. But you see, now, you, now, and many economists would argue, well, what's wrong with that? Well, here's what's wrong with that. In a global market situation, there may be half a dozen producers of some good, such as rice, for example. They're all competing for market share in that marketplace. So countries that are importing rice or grain, whatever it might be, it doesn't really matter, uh, will seek out the lowest price among producer countries. But that drives down prices. Now again, economists were, well, that's a good thing because it means that uh, there's a greater stimulus uh, to produce efficiently and lower prices means that more people can consume it and so on and so forth. From the ecological point of view, the consequence of that is to increase overall consumption and overall production. But if the prices are being driven so low that the producers have no um, economic surplus, producer surplus, with which to 
husband their resources, manage the soils, take care of the fish stocks or whatever it might be, then the tendency in a competitive global marketplace is to draw down the natural capital assets. So we are eroding the fish stocks, they're disappearing. The soils are being eroded. Uh, our best forests are disappearing because um, there's just not the surplus or the incentive there to take care of those things. Meanwhile, in Europe or wherever it might be, uh, people are unaware of what's happening half a world away and uh, therefore continue to consume at their current rates. It's, it's very similar in a sense to that individual who falls off the roof of a tall building and is, you know, he's, he's fallen 40 floors and there's 10 more to go and he thinks, well, so far so good. If you're in a situation where the price mechanisms aren't revealing incipient scarcities, if you have no idea that the source of your current sustenance is disappearing, then you have no incentive to change your consumption patterns mm -hmm. or do anything else to help the situation out. So globalization achieves everything the economists, well, not everything, but it certainly achieves the purpose of enhancing production, increasing a wealth, although not distributing it fairly, um, but it also accelerates the rate at which we're destroying the productive capacity of the earth because we're trading in bio capacity, we're trading in carrying capacity. And because we don't count it, we treat mm -hmm. it as if it doesn't count. That's right. So it doesn't matter. Yeah, I mean, I think most people would be horrified to know that most uh, standard economic models have no connection whatsoever to the real world. In other words, they're based on money flows, uh, the circular flow of exchange value is, is the classic mother model of all economic thinking. But there's no point of contact to the outside world. So economists have always, in effect, treated uh, resources as free goods. So when you pay for gasoline, nobody pays the earth for the oil and gasoline that it, that it has produced. The cost of gasoline is simply a reflection of the cost of, of stealing it from the planet, as it were, uh, and processing it, plus the taxes the government throws in. And the same is true of any product. So we don't pay for nature's output at all. It's simply considered a free good. And economists have been able to get away with this because there's been such superabundance that uh, it hasn't mattered. And if something has gone scarce, we've substituted something else for it. Mm -hmm. So in the early days of the Industrial Revolution, Britain actually uh, ran out of wood. It cut down its forests to fuel the Industrial Revolution, but it didn't matter. We shifted to coal. And the idea from that kind of, of, of uh, incident is that we can now do that indefinitely. So every time we run out of one thing, we'll simply shift to another. Um, one of the great Nobel laureates, uh, Robert Solow, uh, wrote, uh, uh, did his work in this whole area of the technology's capacity to increase productivity. And he um, wrote in a very famous paper, this is virtually a direct quote, if it is easy to substitute other factors for natural resources, then in effect the world can get along without natural resources. So exhaustion is merely an event, not a catastrophe. So the idea is that it doesn't matter if fish decline because we can build fish farms. It doesn't matter if you run out of wood because we can make aluminum studs. So as long as you believe that every resource that goes extinct has no other consequence than that resource disappearing and we can find a substitute for it, then all our environmental problems disappear. What's there to be concerned about? And that unfortunately is the kind of idea that is fueling most people's attitude toward environments today. Yeah, and and, uh, uh, and it's so patently obvious to somebody like me coming from the East Coast that that's not the case, that once the fish are gone, the consequences of that are vast and, mm -hmm. and perpetual, you know, they go on. Well, those particular fish are gone, but <clears throat> look what's happened. We've now diverted our efforts toward the shrimps and the, you know, other forms yeah. of fish. So what we're seeing around the world as major fish stocks collapse, we simply redirect our fishing effort towards stocks we haven't exploited. We move down the food chain. Uh, one of my colleagues at UBC, Dan Polly, who is the former director of the Fisheries Center, coined the term fishing down the food web. So as each stock is overexploited, we simply move one rung down in the ladder. I mean, look at Canada had the a... Jellyfish are doing very well. Mm -hmm, exactly. So <laughs> at, at some point we'll be eating, you know, the, the algae and jellyfish and so on, the, the lowest end of the food chain. But you know, you, you've raised this whole question coming from the East Coast. 
one of the most egregious uh, mismanagements of any national resort, natural resource on the planet is the collapse of the North Atlantic cod under Canada's watch, which I think we should be ashamed of. But it's a perfectly good example of a number of things. First of all, the extent to which economics and politics simply overrides biological or scientific considerations. But more importantly, the cod didn't collapse because Canadians ate too much fish. It was basically an export market. And so you see another perfect example of how the so-called surplus in Canada was drained to the bottom to satisfy the deficit in fish products elsewhere on Earth. And we can see that repeated over and over again around the, around the Earth. Which kind of brings us back to a point that we haven't made explicit, which is your comment that uh, a North American requires something like eight or nine hectares of mm -hmm. the earth to support him or her and the lifestyle we've, we've achieved. Um, but there isn't that much to go around for everybody. And that's not what other people, that's not yeah. what other people appropriate. So. No, 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 it isn't. Um, and, you know, there's nothing tricky about these numbers. You, you could go to any resource atlas in your local library and add up all of the productive ecosystems on the planet forests, agricultural land, crop, um, grazing land, uh, grasslands, and so on and so forth. P the productive parts of the ocean, which are only about 10% of the seas. And if you add up all of that, and you can use any number of sources, you'll never come to much more than 13 and a half billion hectares. So on the whole of planet Earth, there's only 13 and a half billion ecologically productive hectares capable of producing products that are capable of sustaining human life. Well, there's, what, 6.7 billion people on Earth. So do the math. It means there's less than, let's say for the sake of simplicity, two hectares per capita on Earth. That's all you're entitled to. And if this were a totally equitable or fairly managed planet, each person, assuming everyone is equal to everyone else, would be entitled to the biocapacity of two hectares of average Earth. Well, you and I need, on average, seven to nine hectares to keep us going. So we get four or five times our fair share in North America, while people in places like Malawi, at the, really at the bottom of the global food chain in, in human terms, get less than a quarter of their fair share. So in, in some sense, it reflects another great tragedy of the current situation. There's about a, a billion people on Earth who are obese, and there's another billion who are in chronic caloric malnourishment and uh, the eco footprint reflects that as well. Some of us take four times our fair share, others get a quarter of their fair share. And the point is, you cannot, with any conceivable or, or known technology, raise the entire population to North American material standards. It's not difficult at all to show that it would take at least three to four additional Earth-like planets to support seven billion people at North American material standards sustainably, that is to say indefinitely, without wrecking the planets. And this is what you've called the moral dimension of sustainability. Absolutely. It, it's a moral dimension because, you see, as long as you can assume that growth will address the poverty question, then there's some legitimacy to say, all right, you've made it, uh, but now we're going to continue growing to enable other people to rise to that same standard. But if that's not possible, if it's not possible without destroying the entire biophysical basis of Earth, or at least significant components of it, so that the whole system might come down, then there's another question. And that is, how much are you willing to give up so that somebody in a third world country can at least achieve a reasonably decent standard of living? Mm -hmm. And that's the dilemma I think we're going to have to face in the coming decades. As climate change descends upon us, as we see increasing resource scarcities in the fossil fuel, for example, peak oil phenomenon, peak fish, peak phosphorus, and so on, we're in a situation now where it's becoming increasingly clear that we're overtaxing the um, self-productive capacities of the global ecosystem. And in order to enable the billion and a half or two billion extremely impoverished people to rise to sufficiency, uh, the extremely rich are going to have to come down. It's an extension of an idea called contraction and convergence, which Aubrey Myers in the UK is using to argue 
that uh, the UK and other rich countries have to reduce their carbon dioxide emissions so that other countries uh, can use a little more fuel and this is contraction and convergence to some sustainable level. Well, right now on planet Earth, the sustainable level of consumption is the equivalent to the production and assimilative capacities of about two average Earth hectares. And we need four times that to get by in North America. Yeah, so that, that tells you that for the, if you're going to deal with this moral issue, you really have to talk about a great deal less consumption in the first world to allow an adequate consumption in the third world. We do, and, and to many people that's a horrific notion. Um, but you know, it, it's actually technically not that difficult. Uh, there are lots of literatures, lots of literature out there to suggest that we could probably get four or five times as much a utility or usefulness out of every resource input. Most of our cars use four times as much fuel as we need to get around. Just replacing a standard light bulb with a spiral one saves you 80% of the energy right there. So if we look through the economy, but there's a book called Factor 5 that summarizes much of this. We might be able to double production with half the input, which is equivalent to increasing what is called factor productivity by four without changing our lifestyles very much. Now that means that we could actually remain where we are while reducing our consumption by a factor of four, freeing up resources to be used, to be used by someone else. So that's the technological side of things. But there's another issue here, and I think this is more important, and that is that if you look at so-called objective indicators of population health or well-being, there's almost no correlation between the continually rising incomes in rich countries and those objective indicators. So in other words, for at least 40 years now, we have not been gaining in any substantive way in terms of infant mortality rates, longevity, post-operative survival, and so on and so forth. Those things are not changing in ways that can be correlated to rising incomes per se. Okay? So at something like ten or $12,000 per capita per year, a fraction, a quarter or less of, of typical rich country material standards, you've already got it all in terms of um, most of those factors of population health. Similarly, if we look at various surveys of people's so-called subjective well-being, their sense of uh, felt well-being. Uh, similarly, there's no correlation with income. So that, uh, in fact, in North America... Oh, to a certain level there is. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. at, 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 say below... Uh, well, if you're in poverty and not being mm -hmm. fed, clothed, or housed, uh, clearly there's a, a great benefit in, in rising income. Mm -hmm. But again, it, it's called diminishing returns. So you, you have a very strong relationship between income and well-being to a point, then it starts to level out and then it just goes flat. And in fact, in, in terms of felt well-being, there's evidence that in many countries, there's a negative correlation beyond a certain point. So that some evidence suggests North Americans were overall happiest in the 1950s. And even though incomes have doubled or trebled since then, there's been a decline in the numbers of people reporting themselves as happy or very happy on various indices in, in the literature. So you, you, again, you have to ask yourself, what would an intelligent species do? So we have all of this evidence that rising rates of consumption are destroying the planet, which will ultimately result in, in huge problems for all of us. Uh, yet we insist on growing, which is causing that problem, even though there are no objective or subjective indications that those of us who already have reached some critical income level are benefiting from further growth. So if we were truly a rational or intelligent species, we'd be looking for two things. Where is that income level on which we max out in terms of our felt well-being as well as population or, uh, health indicators? And secondly, what's the optimal scale of the global economy? How much throughput, how much energy and material can move through the economy without drawing down the critical capital, uh, the natural productive capital, or filling up the waste sinks? So what we need to do is to identify the optimal scale for the global economy and then allocate it among different countries on a fair basis and uh, determine how we're going to live within the limits of the planet. Because if we don't do that, it's going to take, take us down. Mm.
You know, in, in many ways, the, the collapse of the North Atlantic cod would have been devastating to Newfoundland had there not been someone else to, ready to bail them out, right? I mean, we're, are we still paying $425 a month for each family affected by that collapse? If there hadn't no. been that external source of sucker, then Newfoundland would have been in a tra tragic situation, much worse than it already is. But it's well now it's it's doing fairly well, and it's a consequence of the oil business. Of, of oil, yeah. but again, that's yeah. another depleting resource. Yeah. So it'll rise to a certain point, and then bang, it'll be left just as high and dry when the oil is gone, as it was when the fish were gone. Uh, but uh, now economists will say, well, it doesn't matter. They'll find something else, making computers or whatever it might be. But how long can you keep doing that? How long can you keep uh, serially de uh, destroying over? exploiting resource after resource after resource before the whole global system begins to unravel. And uh, that's, that's the concern that many ecologists have today, that with increasing species loss, with the increasing uh, destruction of major uh, resources that provide the life support functions of the planet, that we're going to reach some tipping point beyond which we, we can't recover. Climate change is perhaps the most obvious uh, area in which that's a real possibility. You've introduced a concept here that I think it's important to sort of dwell on for a second because somewhere in that you've, you, when you talk about the optimal size of the world economy, mm -hmm. you're basically saying there ought to be such a thing as enough. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's not an economist's perspective, is it? No, an economist's perspective is that uh, our material wants are insatiable. And, you know, there's some basis for that. I mean, when you buy a new car, you're thrilled and, you know, for the first month you wash it every third day or whatever, but after a while, eh, you know, it's just a car. And so what happens, biologists talk about satiation. You reach a point where you, know, you are satiated with a particular thing, so you've got to move on to something else. Well, there's all kinds of ways in which we can either encourage or discourage this kind of thing. So in, in the post-war period, um, building on the ideas of a guy called Ed, Edward Bernay, Bernay was a, a nephew of Sigmund Freud, and he knew that we could appeal to people's subconscious wants and desires. And uh, he used this information between the wars, actually, to convince North American corporations that they could increase market share by making people feel um, uh, that they needed things they didn't really need at all. And in the post-war period, you know, we had all of this underemployed labor, returning soldiers, and underutilized capital, factories that had been making guns and ships and equipment, lying idle uh, in the, in the post-war period. Well, let's get that capital and labor together to produce stuff. Well, you also had a population that had been effectively trained by the depression and the rationing of the Second War to live on you know, very little. People were happiest then, by the way. Uh, they had come through this period of deprivation. They'd learned and adapted to living on not very much. And suddenly they're being told they've got to, you know, throw stuff out. And so the consumer society was an invention of the uh, North American industrial enterprise and the public relations and advertising industries to convince people uh, that, to, in effect, to, to quote one marketing expert, we have to make a religion of consumption, to burn up, throw out, and use up stuff as fast as possible to put this incredibly potentially productive economy in place. And so we've literally, what the sociologists would claim, we've socially constructed consumer society, the throwaway society and made of people, instead of being active citizens engaged in, in our communities and in our governments, we've become passive consumers uh, who are trained to respond you know, with bright eyes and, and uh, competitive glee with each other to purchasing the newest gadget, whatever it might be. So we've got to reverse that. We can use the same technology, the same, by the way, this is social engineering. And most people so is that. Of course it is. <laughs> and uh, people today are not aware. I mean, they're appalled at the idea of propaganda. They'd be appalled at the idea of conscious or deliberate social engineering. But the point I'm trying to make is that the generation today is the single most socially engineered group of people ever to inhabit the planet. And they're not even conscious of it. 
But the point of it is that with the internet, with television, with radio, with all the massive capacity for communications that we have, if governments were to take seriously the human dilemma, the, the, the dilemma of climate change, of ecological change, we have at our hands this, uh, the means by which to turn things around in a generation or so. But it'd be a very, very difficult task. Mm -hmm. And by the way, there's no incentive to do it. I mean, corporations had an enormous incentive. It's, you know, the advertising industry in North America, the largest on the planet, is tens of billions of dollars. But they get back all of that and much, much more. Not many people are going to want to put money up to slow the economy down. Yeah. Except, uh, except as the crunch really comes at some point, and we, yeah. Well, what, what, what most of us who work in this domain are trying to do is to get people to understand the nature of the dilemma before the crunch comes. You see, it, it's kind of, I hate using the Titanic as an analogy, but it's a good one. There's no point in standing on the deck and pointing out the iceberg uh, if nobody's going to pay any attention. If we wait until we've struck it, it's too late to do anything. Yeah. You know, you've got two hours before the ship sinks. It may be two decades, but is that really where we want to go? So people are very odd animals. We don't want to respond to something until it's, a, it's a, clearly a crisis. No, nobody's going to believe in global warming until they're up to their knees in water in their own living rooms. You see, so that's our kind of instinctive response. It's a very short-term, uh, reflective, uh, self-interested response. We're endowed with an intellect that knows that that's probably stupid. But our intellectual capacities haven't developed enough to overcome our, intellect, or our instinctive capacities to stay put and uh, look after number one right now in the short term. We're very bad at planning for the future, even though that's what planning is all about. <laughs> what do you do? We have evolved, as um, economists would call us, uh, discounting. We discount mm -hmm. the future. Mm -hmm. So damages off in the future have a very little um, weight in the present day calculus. We know it's wrong, but we do it anyway. Yeah. Now, see, here's where I think, if, 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 when I look at the work of Bill Rees, and I am not, have not looked at it profoundly, but even on a fairly quick you know, view, there seem to be two huge things that stand out. And one of them is, is the ecological footprint as a way of, of understanding mm -hmm. some of these relationships. One of the phrases that you used somewhere along the line that I, I liked very much was the quasi-parasitic relationship mm -hmm. between advanced nations and, and third world nations. But the other one you've tackled is, this, is the huge lethal paradox that we know what needs to be done and we don't do it. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and then that's even at an individual level. I mean, somewhere along the line you, you mentioned the, the situation where you're having the hors d'oeuvre and you think, well, I've had enough. <laughs> and, and, and five minutes later you find yourself nibbling at them again. Mm -hmm. and, but you relate that to evolution, right? Yeah, well, it's a very, very complicated question, obviously. <clears throat> Human beings are a species of organism. And we share a number of things with every species of organism. If we had a petri dish here of nutrient agar and we drop a single bacterium into it, it doesn't matter what species, it'll do the same thing. It will start to use those resources to replicate and within a very few days the entire dish is covered with a colony of bacteria. They've used all the resources, they sporulate and go off to find another petri dish. So every species has that capacity and the innate uh, ability to expand to fill all the available habitat. Um, humans are more successful at this than any other advanced vertebrate animal. You can't find a patch of habitable landscape on this earth any longer that isn't occupied by people. So we exhibit exactly that tendency to expand and to fill all available habitat. But organisms also tend to use all available resources. And we use the same rationale that I'm sure is going on in other species. If I don't use it, somebody else will. I mean, it, it's logical. And if you go back a few thousand years when there was no refrigeration, no means of storing things that was effective, um, you would probably eat every fruit you possibly could on the tree right now, pack it on your backside as fat, uh, because if you didn't do it, you know, the next person or tribe or whatever through this area would. So we have a strong built-in incentive to uh, consume as much as we can right now, a tendency to use all available resources. And that tendency was a perfect adaptation uh, 
10,000, 50,000, even five or 6,000 years ago. We still have the tendency, even though it's now maladaptive. So we are out there, like every other species, driven by subliminal, subconscious tendencies to expand and to consume. And the idea that if you go to a buffet, I've done this a thousand times, where, I, oh, well, those are really good, I'll just have one, I don't want to spoil my dinner. And even without, without thinking of it, I'm back at that buffet 10 seconds later, 10 minutes later, having yet another, and I'll make the same little game with myself. Well, we, we are driven by those kinds of propensities. It's one of the reasons why obesity is such a huge problem in, in North America, at least among the rich. I mean, there's, there's another reason for obesity among poor people. But the point is then we share these common properties with non-human species. At the same time, we're in a competitive environment. So that exacerbates the tendency to overconsume and to expand. Uh, it, when the ice disappears from the north in Canada, in fact, it, it's already disappearing, the floating ice in the Arctic, we should stand back in horror because this it, uh, implies that global warming, climate change is accelerating, and, and, but we're not. Instead, we can hardly wait to get research vessels up there to map the ocean floor to stake a claim to the remaining oil and gas reserves uh, that are causing the problem in the first place. So wherever you look around the planet, in, in every resource domain, the same old stuff is, is coming out. The overriding of that primitive urge to expand and get all the resources we possibly can and consume the oil to the last drop at whatever risk. The blowout in the Gulf of Mexico recently is a perfect example of the hazard associated with uh, deep water drilling, and yet we'll do it anyway, just to get that 8 billion barrels or whatever it might be. By the way, that's a, a one year supply for the United States, and uh, there's not nearly that much oil down there, and look at the risk we took to get it. Hmm. So we are driven in that way. Uh, we know that we're driven in that way, and yet we don't seem to be able to organize ourselves socially to put a stop to it. Any country that goes it alone, uh, acting intelligently in the face of the data, would be overrun by all the others scrambling to, to do the wrong thing. Hmm. So we, our government in Ottawa constantly uses the excuse for not having a carbon dioxide reduction policy. Uh, we can't d harm our competitive position in relation to the United States. We'll wait to see what they're going to do. But of course, the United States, being pressured by its own corporate lobby groups, has all but abandoned its effort now to get even the, the most marginal of climate change legislation through mm -hmm. Congress. So we, we're competitively stuck in a position that is uh, killing us all simultaneously. Now you relate this to three levels of brain mm -hmm. development <laughs> and, and to the tension among the three levels. And I thought this was an extremely revealing Yeah, analysis. what I've drawn on there is, is an idea, um, I guess going back to McLean, John McLean, uh, who coined the term the triune brain. Now, some people think this is oversimplification, but the general pattern is, is clearly there. That human beings uh, have the most advanced neural system of all organisms. Um, we share with all vertebrates, at least advanced vertebrates above reptiles, say, something called the brain stem, the reptilian brain stem. And this is the, the seat of our instinctive behavior, our territorial behavior, uh, fight and flight responses, the release of adrenaline and all of these kinds of things over which we have no control whatsoever. So base survival instincts, which uh, obviously were necessary for you know, reptiles. Well, we've still got that. The, the, the brain has evolved by adding layers as opposed to disposing of the earlier models and coming up with something altogether new. So think of crude instinctive survival behaviors as, as existing in the reptilian brainstem. Very infrequent parental control uh, or parental care, the eggs are just laid and, they, and so on. So there's not much going on there except basic survival. The midbrain or so-called neo or paleomammalian brain, the old mammal brain, introduces emotions for the first time. And we see in other mammals, um, and, and birds for that matter, emotional responses, much higher levels of a parental control, uh, evident pair bonding, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, going the next level up is the cerebral cortex, um, which is more highly advanced 
in humans and in any other organism. So we have instinct in the reptilian brainstem, emotions in the midbrain, and then the intellectual sphere in the higher regions of the brain, the, the, the cerebral cortex, which in humans is about two-thirds by volume of the human brain. So we have unique capacities uh, endowed upon us with that brain, the capacity for intelligence and logical reasoning, the capacity for moral judgments, uh, the capacity for planning, thinking ahead, and so on and so forth. Now, my argument is that these things have come upon us relatively late in the evolutionary sequence. So you could say that there's tens of millions of years of testing the basic instincts that operate at the level of the reptilian brainstem. There are millions more years of, of testing the appropriate emotional responses to various circumstances associated with the midbrain. But intellectual activity has only a few tens of thousands of years at best of being tested as an evolutionary strategy. And almost inevitably and always in, in situations where there's a, a threat or a perceived threat to our safety, our, our social status, our political status, our wealth, we act out of the lower centers rather than the intellectual centers. And you can understand this on a, on a very simplistic level. If I see a tiger running at me, I don't have time to sit down and work out all of the possible intellectual options that, that might be available to me in dealing with this tiger. I act in instinctively. I'm up a tree as fast as I can or I shoot without thinking or whatever. And that's basically, it's a caricature, but it's not far removed from how we seem to act on, in these other domains. So we see the threat posed by climate change but we're not going to do anything because it threatens our current economic status in a competitive global environment. We don't have the, the capacity to move beyond those um, instinctive responses to uh, threats to our perceived political positions, wealth, and so on and so forth. Now, I'm oversimplifying here, but I, don't, I think it's undeniable that these factors are at play. Uh, neurobiology shows it to be the case that... Uh, uh, the human intellect is constantly at war with other urges. Uh, if you think of it in, in these terms, many of our instinctive qualities, we've created legal frames to attempt to overcome them. So marriage is an institution that uh, attempts to civilize people, to stop them from being what we naturally are, which is kind of polygamists. Okay. Well, that won't do if you want to have a stable culture. So you need to erect a cultural framing of that issue that suppresses or overrides the natural instinctive kind of behavior. And what I'm arguing is that we have to recognize there's a huge domain of instinctive behaviors out there that are currently controlling our economic and political uh, behavior, as it were, and that we need to erect on an international basis uh, a series of uh, formal legal institutions and laws that will restrain that kind of behavior so that we can come together at a much higher level, an intellectual level, and work out the plan for the future. There has to be a global plan, not just a competitive scramble to use up the last remaining resources. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess I'm, I'm passionate about this because um, we're seeing in history, the results of, of our failure to do this. I mean, societies that continue to be driven and who continue to ignore the writing on the wall, as it were, uh, are prone to collapse. And I think we're now a global society and there's nothing uh, that makes us so different from earlier cultures that we won't also collapse should we, you know, pass over some tipping point beyond which there's no return. But if we do it this time, we do it for the whole species, not just for a local society. Well, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's true in two ways. First of all, it won't do, for, you know, Canada be, could become, in theory, an ideal, a sustainably behaving nation. But if the rest of the world carries on, we go down with it, mm -hmm. right? So there's nothing in it for any one nation to go it alone, which should provide, again, this is the intellect operating, if, the, if we can't go it alone, and we're almost certainly doomed in a competitive strength, uh, struggle for remaining resources and so on, then the, this is insane. The only way out is to come together 
and to form some kind of mutually assured, I mean, this is what it is, it's mutually assured survival as opposed to mutually assured destruction. Mm -hmm. And we need to create uh, in our common interests the kind of international framework that will reorganize the global economy so that there's adequacy for all and therefore sustainability instead of attempting to bring everybody up to an impossible material standard that the planet mm -hmm. can't support. And uh, we either do it or we don't. Ooh, yeah. Let me make one other point here. You see, throughout the evolution of any species, um, the individual act in ways that enhance their own survival and their capacity to have offspring. So we are very finely tuned to satisfy our individual self-interest. This may be extended to the tribe. So, you know, we are still tribal. That's why nation states exist. That's why we still have religions. That's why different ideologies will go to the wall. They're fighting for common interests that are shared by members of that tribe. Well, the point is that for the first time in the evolution of humankind, it may well be that my individual best interests are served by serving the common interests of humanity at large. So that if every nation and every individual within every nation simply tries to satisfy their own short-term utilitarian relationship with the planet, it's doom. We will just consume everything and uh, compete and there'll be resource wars and all the rest of it. But if we recognize that that's the case, that by following our highly adaptive 50,000 years ago tendencies that have become maladaptive today, we first of all have to recognize it, that this is a maladaptive trait today because the environmental circumstances have changed. That means we need to go to the next level up. So for the first time in the history of our species, my individual interests have converged with the common good, with the interests of the community as a whole. Sustainability is a collective problem. It needs to be solved at the level of collective governance. We can't solve it as individuals. We can't solve it as individual states. Right, right. And you've also identified a second maladaptive area, and that's the area of what you call mimetic maladaption, right? <laughs> Cultural yeah. maladaption, uh, yeah. the problem of narrative, as you once described it, which well, I think well, is... Uh, yeah, we, we've, we've kind of touched on this in our earlier conversation, but I, I mentioned that humans are like other species. We have a natural propensity to expand and to use all available resources. Well, in the worst of all possible worlds, and I think that's where we are right now, the culture in which we are embedded will reinforce those tendencies. So if you think of our, our current economics, I mean, it's a competitive economics. It makes the assumption that human beings are, quote, self-interested utility maximizers with fixed preferences and insatiable, human dem insatiable material demands. So it portrays people as greedy individuals who can never get enough and that the only job of the market is to make sure there's always a sufficient supply to maintain uh, you know, these people who have insatiable demands going. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is our cultural narrative, if you like. It's the economic mythos around which we've created a whole society. So it tends to reinforce the now maladaptive tendencies that, that we have inherited as, as, as living beings that have been so successful in bringing us to this point. Now, what could be worse than a world uh, driven by its primitive instincts to expand and to compete and to consume everything, to have a cultural narrative that says growth is possible and, and the only thing the economy needs to do is to get more efficient and to create markets and means by which uh, we expand, 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 and expand. Well, when you have the cultural narrative or the memes reinforcing the genes, and then you've got the worst of all possible circumstances. A meme is simply a nugget of cultural information, a set of beliefs, values, or assumptions. Uh, ideolo ideological paradigm uh, is a meme or a meme complex. So we now have genes that are driving us to expand and cultural memes that reinforce that tendency. Sustainability will only come when we understand the nature of our genetic drivers and create counterweights in the social domain. Culture is the primary driver of human evolution today. But if we have a culture that is uh, 
reinforcing the worst in maladaptive tendencies, it can do us in. So we need to take advantage of our cultural evolution, which is much more rapid than genetic evolution, to override the maladaptive genetic tendencies and to create the kind of stable, steady state configuration that ecological economists think is necessary. Which brings you out at the point of saying, well, the way you have said in the past is, is that the environmental crisis is less an environmental and technical problem than it is a behavioral and social one. Mm -hmm. um, because, the problem, because I take it your view is this is not insoluble if, if we could get our behavior yeah. in order. Huh? No, it, it, technically it's a soluble problem. Mm -hmm. We know exactly what we need to do. Well, not exactly, but we know generally what we need to do. Now we're dealing here with complex uh, individual behavior, uh, social behavior, the behavior of groups, which is quite different from individual behavior, and political behavior. And again, we've known about the basic dimensions of the problems we're uh, confronting here for a very long period of time. Um, a wonderful book you can download from the internet is called The Crowd, A Study of the Popular Mind by a, a French psychologist in the late 1900s of the late 1800s, sorry, 19th century. And it's all about how mob behavior, which by the way is what advertisers take advantage of in, in exploiting our desires for this, that, or whatnot. Um, another marvelous book is called The March of Folly by Barbara Tuchman, who's an American historian. And the folly she's referring to is the lack of intelligence in governance. The fact that over and over again, she goes right back to Troy and takes it all the way up to the Vietnam era in the United States to show that time after time after time, governments implemented policies against the long-term interests of themselves or their people, in spite of the fact that alternatives that were clearly better were known, they did it anyway. Why did they do it? They did it to protect the political status of the individuals involved, the, the corporate wealth of the backers of the individuals involved. So we act in a kind of cage here where the intellectual knowledge of what should be done is overridden by these primitive instincts to, to protect our individual status in society or whatever it might be. And uh, she laments the fact that it just doesn't ever change. And I heard, well, of course it doesn't, because you're dealing with people. And until people come to understand what it is that truly motivates them and the decisions they're taking, we don't have a hope of, of changing those very motivations. We've got a lack of self-knowledge, mm -hmm. coupled with um, a set of narratives that mm -hmm. are desperately counterproductive. Mm -hmm. um, so the point, of, the point of attack, in a way, would seem to be the cultural narrative. Right? That, Absolutely. That would be the point where we, where we have the possibility of evolving fast enough to make some real difference. Yeah, that, that's what I've been arguing in a lot of my <clears throat> recent work, that until we're prepared to examine the, the fundamental underpinnings of the prevailing cultural narratives, including our economic narrative, our competitive you know, relationship narrative and all of that, until we begin to examine what they are all about and understand their role in driving the ecological crisis, it's not going to go away. So we really do need, and in fact it's a privilege if you think about it, I've, I've talked about this may be the first generation that self-consciously takes up the pen in, in allegory here and rewrites its uh, cultural narrative for survival. So all the others have simply evolved over time. Here we now have a, a, a crisis that our intellect at least tells us is upon us, and yet our behavior is so disconsonant with that impending crisis uh, that we need to examine what is it in our cultural narrative that is causing that spread. It's, it's partly the cultural narrative and then rewrite that narrative so that it comes into consonance with the nature of the crisis upon us. And it's a huge job. And because look at the, the, the controversies that come out over something like climate change. There you have a group of big coal, big oil, who've literally rewritten the narrative so that people don't believe climate change is real. So there's an enormous, a multi-billion dollar campaign going on uh, because the corporate sector knows very well how important it is to, in effect, change the narrative so that it favors what they are doing 
and is against the broader and common interest. So what I'm saying is not impossible. It can be done. It is being done, but it's being done against the interests of the Commonwealth. It's being done in favor of the, 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 the people with the greatest stake in the status quo. So, I mean, it, it, one of my colleagues in the States has identified something like 700 new think tanks that have been founded in the last well, few decades for the specific purpose of denying global change science, particularly climate change science, and to create such a sense of doubt among the public that no significant policy action can be taken to change it around. Well, that protects their corporate interest. They've rewritten the narrative. They've made it sound as if uh, climate scientists are a bunch of maniacs. And so people deny what they can see with their own eyes around them and in favor of this belief that nothing's happening, created through the social engineering of think tanks under the rubric of, well, trying to deny climate science. You, uh, at one point you mentioned, and I, it's really striking, I mean, I th uh, you mentioned the, the gap between the front page and the business page, mm -hmm. you know, that you look at the front page and there's the Gulf oil catastrophe and there's the, you know, the floods in Pakistan, which mm -hmm. I would guess are related to the, to the melting glaciers. Um, the, you know, there's a whole, and you know, the, 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 the waters of the Arctic are becoming visible, mm -hmm. a big chunk of ice has dropped off Greenland. This is all on the front page and on the business page that you, you don't believe they'd be in the same on the same planet. There's no sense of this reality at all. Uh, <clears throat> that's right. I think there's a complete dissonance between what we are willing to entertain. I mean, it, news has almost become entertainment. Mm. Um, but what we really do is in the, the business pages. I mean, that, that's where the heart of enterprise goes forward. That's where our government takes its cues. So we don't seem to be able to make the connection between the large-scale global changes that are apparently taking place around us and the business-as-usual stance that, that uh, governments take. Um, many would say this is symptomatic of, of clinical denial. We're in a state of denial about the nature of our reality. We're so entrained in thinking a particular way and that the observations that something has gone awry are taken as kind of curiosities or if we accept them, um, then we're confronted with the, the wall of denial that emerges as an official policy of big coal and big oil to, to put that stuff aside. So it's, I think it's a pretty good illustration of the kind of internal tension that exists between our instinctive and our intellectual capacity to cope with the world. There's another element here, and that is that um, cognitive psychologists, cognitive neurologists uh, have discovered in the last couple of decades that as the individual brain develops, uh, a person growing up in a particular cultural environment will repeatedly hear certain values, certain beliefs, certain um, cultural norms. And over time, the repetition of these things becomes literally a part of the hard wiring of that individual's brains. What I'm really saying here is that in the course of the first 20-25 years of a person's life, social experiences, environmental experiences that are repeated over and over again literally help to shape the synaptic circuitry of the brain. So that uh, by the time you've reached early adulthood, you have acquired a set of circuitries or, or neural networks that like to be reinforced. They release the pleasure hormones when they are reinforced. So we have a situation in which people tend to seek out experiences that reinforce their already existent beliefs and values and to reject experiences, deny experiences that um, tend to conflict with those norms. So if you can imagine a whole, well, we do this generation after generation, what our schooling does, what our economic schools do, and so on and so forth, is train people in a particular way of thinking about reality. And they acquire that, um, what we call a paradigm, an academic paradigm. It could be a religious dogma. It could be a political uh, ideology. Once it's in place, it becomes really difficult to dislodge it.
And now again, this is a biological quality that interacts with our cultural environment. If you think back a few thousand years when people lived in small tribes, there was a real advantage to an individual learning and having embedded in his neural circuitry the beliefs, values, assumptions, legends of the tribe. So that, after all, if that group was surviving, they must be doing something right. Mm -hmm. So for the individual to acquire a successful strategy for negotiating his way or her way through the world was an adaptive thing. Well, leap forward, we're the same animal, basically. We still go through that process of having our cultural norms, in a sense, ingrained in our brains, but now it's maladaptive. If, if we're in a situation where the prevailing, we, we talked earlier about the prevailing um, uh, cultural narrative, this, it's all part of that. If, if that narrative is dissonant with the rest of the world, with the nature of the reality which, within which we find ourselves, it's going to cause us to ignore those things which uh, threaten the narrative. So going back to the newspaper, all of those horror stories on the first page are clearly threats to the business pages, which is really where we live. I mean, that's, that's the kind of narrative that we all want to uh, talk about, the growing economy. We think of an economy that's growing at 3% a year as a bit sluggish. 2% is almost, and, and then if it's in recession, we're in, you know, it's a horror show. But a 2% per year growth is a doubling in 35 years, which may mean an almost doubling of, of our impacts. So th this is an insane policy, and yet it's the one to which we are wedded, right? Intellectually, uh, in terms of our political ideologies, even uh, the religious right in the United States would pick up on this. So we have many, many forms of cultural reinforcement uh, of a particular neural circuitry that encourages behavior uh, that keeps us stuck in the status quo. Mm -hmm. And that means that we tend to trivialize or marginalize the various signs that we're going off the rails. And hence we're all, in a sense, uh, in enormous tension between the intellect and the, the more hardwired and instinctive parts of the... It's not very hopeful doesn't yield a very hopeful scenario, does it? Well, you, you could think of it that way. I mean, I, I vacillate between completely unrealistic optimism and utterly depressing uh, despair. Mm -hmm. But the optimism, is, I, I don't like the word optimism. Optimism, pessimism, they're states of mind that don't have anything to do with reality. But what we can be is realistic. And the realistic thing is to say, look here, uh, it's kind of, as you would say, pessimistic to think of the way these things operate. But knowing about them gives us the opportunity to change them. So if hard wiring, or if, if the cultural narrative, the beliefs, values, and assumptions within which a person grows have a real influence on our behavior because it becomes entrenched in some neural circuitry, then let's create the narrative that will be constructive in the circumstances in which we find ourselves. And that's the only way cultural progress occurs. If you don't adapt to changing external or exogenous circumstances, you will go down. And if, if you read a book like Jared Diamond's uh, book, The Collapse of, Com no, uh, his was Collapse, right. How Societies Choose to Fail or Succeed, mm -hmm. those societies that succeeded, small as they were, were cultures that were able to examine their core values, uh, were able to c connect them to the problems they were having, and then to toss out those core values and to replace them with something that conformed to the nature of their new reality. They survived. But cultures that insisted on the, the maintenance of the status quo, um, I don't care if that's happening, I'm going to keep, you know, my dad, it was good enough for my dad, it's good enough for me. That kind of attitude is sure death and certain collapse for a culture in a rapidly changing environment. So what I'm saying is that in many ways we've been pre-adapted uh, both culturally and biologically for a fairly static situation in terms of the external environment. And so it's not surprising that we uh, tend to retain behaviors that were successful in those kinds of environments. It's not surprising that the learning that goes on in our society 
It creates a neural circuitry that reinforces the status quo. It was an adaptive strategy. Mm -hmm. But if you are in a culture in which the exogenous, the outside environment, in this case the climate and the ecosphere, is changing very rapidly, if you aren't able as a culture to track those changes and to maintain yourself in relation to those changes in ways that guarantee your survival, that's what we mean by resilience. If you can't be resilient, you're dead. And unfortunately, we see uh, very little evidence on a, on a large scale of, of cultural resilience in the face of global change. And that may be the place where we need to put our efforts. Absolutely. And that's why I incur, I think, there's so many um, small, marginalized uh, movements around the planet now, everything from back to the earth to you know, voluntary simplicity. These are kind of little lifeboats. The Titanic mm -hmm. is blasting along, but a few people are, are getting in lifeboats. And if the Titanic goes down, maybe uh, there'll be sufficient wisdom among the survivors in the lifeboats to see us through for yet another round. Mm -hmm. I find that theme in a lot of the people I talk to on this mm -hmm. project, that, that uh, the, the sense that it may be impossible to stave off a very large catastrophe in, in terms of human mm -hmm. numbers, um, but there may be uh, fragments of the... Uh, um, of the population that survive in these kinds of ways and that those will be yeah. the ones that are the points of light for the next phase. Yeah, some people say, you know, it's the end of the earth that we're going to destroy the planet. I, I don't believe that at all. I mean, first of all, life will go on. Uh, there's almost nothing we could do to the planet to eliminate life and 10 billion years, not billion, but 10 million years from now, maybe as verdant and as productive and as wonderful as it was before the industrial era. We could conceivably extinguish our own species. If we got into a nuclear conflagration over the remaining oil reserves, or for any reason at all that relates to these primitive instinctive responses, that could do us in, make it impossible to survive as a species. One, one problem is that, and I think it was who said, uh, Hoyle, <coughs> um, a long time ago pointed out that his words were something, civilization is a one-shot affair because we've used up all the available energy, we've scattered the resources and so on and so forth. Well, if we keep this intact and learn to tap into the sun, we might be able to keep the whole thing going. But if we destroy it in some kind of great nuclear you know, outrage, uh, then there would be almost nothing left for which, with which survivors could reassemble a global civilization. At least it wouldn't be nearly as easy as it has been for us. So there is a, a real possibility that we could completely eliminate the possibilities for global civilization. Uh, we won't destroy the planet. We could destroy ourselves in that sense. What the neuropsychology tells us is that it is possible to rewire, to retrain the brain uh, by the way, you know, we have lots of expressions in English that reflect this view. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. People do become habituated in the, in the way they think and so on. But what the psychologists say is that although you can retrain people, it's very difficult. It is very difficult to people, for people to give up cherished beliefs, for a scientist to abandon the paradigm on which he's worked forever. It took a long time for people trained in, in the Newtonian mode of physics to think highly of, of uh, Einstein and certainly the um, uh, new physics around particle physics and quantum mm -hmm. mechanics and so on. Very difficult paradigms for people trained in the old way to accept. It's the same in other disciplines. Whole books written about it. The, the uh, what is it, the, the, uh, the structure of scientific revolution by uh, Thomas Kuhn was all about what it takes to push one old idea out of the way when a new and better idea emerges. It's a very, very difficult thing. So here's the problem. On a cultural level, when there's uh, competitive reasons to stay in place and all the rest of it, it seems even more difficult. Uh, it would be tragic, and, and this is the, one of the things that does move people to accept the new paradigm or a new way of thinking, is catastrophe. So denial is most easily broken by catastrophic events. So I have to say I'm among those people who sometimes find myself wishing for a catastrophe that doesn't actually derail the whole system, but at least wakes it up sufficiently to make it easy to facilitate the kind of shift that we need. So once we're entrained in a particular way of thinking, once that neural circuitry 
is in place. It is difficult to shift, but catastrophe is one way to make it happen fairly quickly, unfortunately for, for those involved. Yeah, that's right. But you know, the, the, for that to work, there has to be an obvious link between the catastrophe mm -hmm. And the new paradigm, or the yeah. superior, or the old paradigm. I mean, I think one could make a pretty good case that we've seen that already. That that's a, well, a good example would be New Orleans, right? That we've known for a long, long time that New Orleans was below sea level. We've known that sea level is rising. We've known they've stripped away the coastal <laughs> defenses. We've known that hurricanes were. I mean, Katrina should not have been a surprise, right? No, and, and it, indeed it wasn't. It was foreseen. I mean, there was a very deep, two or three very detailed papers that predicted almost exactly what happened. So, um, but it's it, not connected in well, people's minds to these larger issues that we've been talking about. Yeah, there's a great deal of popular and, and public ignorance there. I have to say, I'm sometimes asking myself whether if that had been New York, we wouldn't have seen a more, you know, um, active response on the part of the U.S. government. There's a racial element here that I don't think we can, can deny that it was relatively poor and, and much, mostly a black population that suffered the worst consequences mm -hmm. of the Katrina disaster. So it has to be something, well, like 9-11. Mm -hmm. Now, 9-11 was a trivial event compared even to K Katrina. Mm -hmm. And yet it galvanized the entire United States because there was, I mean, who would dare attack the United States? You see, mm -hmm. it brought forward all of those tribal instincts in defense of the home domain. So it was such a powerful response, precisely because it tapped into not only the cultural narrative of the United States' utter supremacy on the planet, but also it threatened the fundamental survival instincts at the very level of tribe. I mean, we are being attacked. And because of that, it's a perfect illustration of many of the things we've been talking about. The Bush administration was able to fabricate an entire skein of lies around why we go in, or why they went into Iraq, justified mm -hmm. on the basis of the 9/11 attack and, and, and so on and so forth. No truth to it at all. But it didn't matter because the nation was already primed uh, by these previous events mm -hmm. to go with the tribal interests as, as defined by their, their government. So uh, again, it's it's the kind of small catastrophe. I mean, yeah, I, I have a great deal of, for, you know, for the two or three thousand people killed there. But goodness, we killed hundreds of thousands of innocent civilians in Iraq in the subsequent, we don't hear about them. The point is, though, that that event was the kind of galvanizing catastrophe that brought the whole nation together to spend billions and billions of dollars on a particular issue. Mm -hmm. If a fraction of that were put into alternative energy or dealing with the climate change issue, it would have an astonishing effect, particularly if it were a global virus that started moving around. And that's what we need. We need something like uh, an ecological 9-11 to galvanize some major nation like the United States into taking that kind of action. In fact, I've, I've often fantasized what would be the effect of the Prime Minister of Britain or even Canada but particularly the, Prime Minister, or the President of the United States, standing up on the world stage and saying, well, look, we have really screwed up. Our economic paradigm is completely incompatible with the nature of biophysical reality. We need to now begin a, a, a fast-track program of global reassessment of what it means to be a globalized civilization and to work toward the kinds of things well, that we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. It might have an incredible impact. But I haven't seen anyone, and, and even but something would have to motivate the president to do that. Well, I, well, and there's I, your 9/11 again. I think. That's right. There's my 9/11. Yeah. I mean, the, the simple reality is that even this this extreme summer we've had, Russia's gone right off the charts in terms of its. Uh, it's statistically possible that it could have happened without any human intervention. So it's not until you've reached a certain, I mean, if you get a dozen statistically remote events happening all at once, and it's pretty clear there's something else going on there. Mm -hmm. But when you see individual events like that hurricane or this heat wave, it's very difficult to make that formal connection to something much bigger than that. But if we were to see, um, you know, a massive meltdown of, of the Greenland and Antarctic ice cap simultaneously in a a doubling or troubling of the rate of ocean level rise, that might be a sufficient connection to get people to realize that, hey, you know, there is something to this climate yeah, change. Yeah. But so far, no go.
Bill Reese makes a habit of asking the really difficult, really searching questions and trying to quantify the answers. He's a leader in the worldwide movement to find better answers by taking better measurements. If you enjoyed this interview, you may want to check out our interview with Ronald Coleman about the Genuine Progress Index and our interview with the Prime Minister of Bhutan, Jigme Thinley, whose government uses these measurements to assess Bhutan's progress towards a sustainable future. The Green Interview is produced and directed by Chris Beckett with the generous cooperation of Mount St. Vincent University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. For The Green Interview, I'm Silver Donald Cameron. See you next time.